since our vision is to grow you know by the community with the community with the other founders so when, when i say community i basically mean other founders hello everybody i'm kp and welcome to million dollar exits a special segment on my main show the building public podcast in this interview series i sit down with founders who went from an idea to building a business and then eventually selling it for over a million dollars hence the name million dollar exits this is something i'm very passionate about and curious about at this point in my career i want to learn and share all the insights mindset shifts lessons and non-obvious tips that are part of this unique journey with the next wave of founders who want to take this path as well so buckle up and get ready to be inspired and informed Here's a special shout out to our episode sponsor, Parallect.com. Million dollar ideas come from every possible niche. If you're a busy domain expert in marketing, sales, finances, or healthcare, and don't want to spend six months just to build an MVP, you'll find Parallect super valuable. Parallect is a venture studio built to design, build, and launch a product for you that is ready to sell in under two months. Start with no code or go full stack right away. Simply focus on growing your early adopter community and build in public, and they'll take care of the rest. Build your million dollar startup with Parallect.com. P A R A L E C T.com. In today's episode, you will meet John Rush. John is the founder of MarsX, which is a dev tool that's making $1.5 million in annual recurring revenue with over 20,000 developers in the ecosystem. John has been a software expert and entrepreneur for over 15 years and has made multiple acquisitions, including Unicorn Platform. By the way, you might remember that we had the founder of Unicorn Platform, Alex Zora, on the podcast earlier this year, and that's how I got to know about John. On this episode, we went deep into the trenches talking about AI, John's vision for MarsX, how and why he acquired the Unicorn platform, and his advice on how to validate new ideas for bootstrap founders. I had a blast recording this episode and hope you'll find value in it too. With that said, I bring you John. Enjoy. Hello, everybody. Welcome. And I'm your host, KP. And today we are here to um, do another interview um, on the Million Dollar Exits podcast. I'm super thrilled to invite John Rush into the show. John, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. John is joining us from Istanbul, which is his uh, home now for for four four years almost. Um, and we were just riffing about the tech scene in Istanbul. Like, so John, um, let's start there. How would you describe um, the sort of the blossoming tech slash indie hacking scene in Istanbul? What what are some observations you have there for? any of the listeners who might be curious. Yeah, four years ago when I arrived here, like I think there was no tech scene as, as we know it now. So there were a couple of bigger big startups acquired by big other big startups. But now I think the indie tech scene is really gr growing fast here uh, because the new generation of Turkish people is uh, looking at the West and uh, and they want to get this financial independence and uh, they use Twitter a lot. Twitter is one of the most popular networks here and uh, every few days I find somebody on Twitter who is actually from Istanbul while I was like not searching particularly for that, right? So that's kind of good and uh, I'm meeting people uh, who are doing other projects and uh, I like it here. So I think uh, in the next maybe 10 years, Istanbul probably will be one of the best growing, uh, you know, tech scene for indie projects, like not the VC backed projects, but this, you know, bootstrap self-funded stuff uh, in Europe. I, I have high bet on that. Right. I, I love, I love that vision um, because a lot of our listeners are self-funded or bootstrapped. I think I'm personally, I also had two bootstrap startups this year, you know, both SaaS mm. um, and we can get into it in a second, but like, I feel like you can go a long way in 2023 with just bootstrapping, right? With the rise of no code and AI tools and the, sort of the, you know, the it was very expensive to to uh, run servers and like to have all these advanced functionalities for a lot of the SaaS ideas you may have in the past, but now the costs are going down, which means you can take more shots, you know? Um, what is, I mean, you've been in the game for 
15 years in the, in the, in the exactly in the, or since game, right? 2008 yeah yeah so exactly how would you characterize years. like if you have to divide this into three or four eras you know and you're from your own career yeah. like how would you characterize the trends of like 26 2006 to you know maybe five years later and then five years later yeah so it started very different than it is now. So I remember when I was in university, like uh, we all wanted to build something, uh, but you know, we were not uh, like the world back then was not the web. It was applications or uh, games. So people would either think about the game. A lot of people would build game uh, back then. And then uh, others would think about some, you know, this desktop application that that's a file at the end, and then you would kind of distribute some somehow, right? And that was the beginning. Uh, and then suddenly uh, the web came in, Facebook uh, movie came in, uh, and we all saw the movie, uh, uh, the social network, and then uh, we all started building some web stuff. And uh, yeah, so it was like five years of building web stuff. Uh, it was easy, so you wouldn't really need funding that. We didn't even think you can get funding. So until 2012, uh, getting funding was nearly impossible for most developers. Like in my network, and I had large network, like hundreds of developers, there was nobody who got funding. We knew one guy who got funding, right? Uh, and uh, like he would tell the, the stories in university about that case, how they got funding, but it was very rare. So the VC scene was quite small, but then in in 20, uh, 2012, things changed. So the VC scene just you know exploded, especially in Oslo. Like Oslo was uh, having no scene at all, and then suddenly the government put money into the startups, and then the VCs come in. And from twenty uh, twelve to twenty eighteen, like this is large. Kind of a chunk, like six years, it was very easy to get money. Uh, almost everybody I knew was running a startup, and almost everybody I knew managed to raise a VC round, at least seed round. Uh, so things were going quite well for that sake. Right. Uh, and but uh, one observation that was quite interesting so the people who started early, who went through this struggle of not having VC funding. Mm. and you know doing it on their own and then when we got the money it really helped us right but then the people who came into the game uh and get money straight from the beginning uh like the failure rate there was huge like in mm. in my batch uh, where i was uh in in like 2010 like the first batch it, it was basically the first 10 startups of norway i would say mm. like we had four unicorns like wow. it's, it's yeah, it's, it's Kahoot, probably, you know, the company. Yeah, uh, Kahoot, yes, wow. Yeah, that's our batch, and we have wow. same investors. And then uh, Xaneta and, you know, t two more. So it was really good batch and uh, very successful, uh, you know, four unicorns, and the rest did well as well, right? Mm. Uh, but then the next one was worse, and then it was worse and worse, <laughs> right? So that's what I basically had in this regular startup world until 2000, um, like 2018, I guess. And then in 2018, I entered this indie world, like bootstrap, self-funded, solo, etc. cetera. Uh, and uh, I did that because I made some money before. I had, uh, you know, this uh, portfolio of investments I made. Uh, I've been doing angel investments. And then uh, I had uh, startups I've co-founded. So I had this uh, revenue stream coming. And... Uh, I didn't really want to have an exit because if you have an exit and you have a lot of money, uh, you have to think how to store it. And that's right. not easy, I yeah. would say. And, and then I thought it's, it's better I have revenue and I use it for my next ventures. And then I right. you know, turned into this world and uh, there I am. Like uh, fifth year, I'm in this, uh, I'm not solo. I have co-founder, I have large team. I have a lot of people around me. But first two years, I was alone completely doing everything mm -hmm. on my own. Uh, and it was cool. Like after having you know large teams and expectations and investors and everything, running the stuff yourself on your own pace, own speed, is kind of fun, but not yeah. for too long, right? Like yeah, once people it... start using your product, it's not fun. It's fun right. when nobody is using your product. <laughs> <laughs> once you have people that expect you know great things, and you're like, oh, now you gotta you gotta ship at that velocity yeah. and like, you know deal with the sub you get a boss. Right, yeah, you, you get, get the boss. micro micro bosses, right? Um, <laughs> exactly. So 
You know, that's fascinating. So let's talk about, you know, your biggest focus area now, right? Which is um, MarsX. Um, and I, I want to understand how would you sort of describe what Mars is for for the listeners? Yeah, so the main goal of Mars is to accelerate software development. And we do it through reusing uh, ready-made micro apps. Mm -hmm. So all these years when I was building stuff, uh, every project we would have to build kind of from scratch. Like, right. You know, the user profile, the search, the gallery, like all the features. We would manage to reuse some stuff, but you know, as time goes on, uh, the, the stuff you've written two years ago, like nobody wants to use that code anymore, right? It's just right. like not a cool code. Yet. And um, I just realized that there's no good way to reuse your own code and the code of the others. And then I thought, like, it's kind of really, really bad for the overall progress. It's like in science, uh, if you do something, you can use all the stuff other people have done, all the papers, right. everything, right? Right. But in software, you pretty much start from scratch every single time. Like, mm -hmm. you know, thousand teams in the world right now sit down and write Uber code, like another, like, you know, thousand versions of the same thing, right? right. Airbnb, Uber, and all those things. And I felt like uh, it is, it has to be changed. And then, uh, you know, that was, like why, why we start Mars. So it is uh, the micro app reusing platform, I would say, but it, it's a lot more than that, right? It's It has its own ID. And then the, the second big thing we have is that we realize that people actually uh, struggle on picking no code, low code and, and professional code. You have to pick one at the beginning and then you can't mm -hmm. really change. Uh, mm -hmm. And then we thought like, what if we do something that you can actually switch within the same project at any time between the interfaces. And then wow. you don't have to choose. Like, you know, some parts of your application are, are really, you know, going well with no code and some uh, need pro code experience. And then right. uh, now we added AI there. Uh, so it's kind of like, you know, three interfaces on top of one project. And below the project, you have hundreds of micro apps that, that you can take and use. And then uh, you basically save like nine different five percent of the time and then five percent is left to actually build what's not there and to connect things together right it's brilliant i mean so i'm just reading out some of the stats around mars uh, it's 1.5 million arr correct yeah it was like, the last based on your twitter bio Twenty thousand devs um and 300 plus micro apps in the showcase that's that's crazy that's amazing like i'm curious when you say 300 plus micro apps in the showcase, um, is it is it that the, these 20,000 developers or whoever, like basically these these are apps that were built by other people using Mars um, that someone brand new can come in and then also reuse that yeah. or? Yeah. Okay. yeah, so the idea here is that uh, comparing to other platforms which wanna, you know, build everything on their own and then kind of provide it to the users like like superbase or like uh you now all of them uh we realized that it's really difficult to actually do that because time moves on and the code gets obsolete really fast fast you know uh, and then and if it's centralized that, approach as opposed yeah, to decentralized approach exactly right? exactly exactly so uh, the only way to do well is to decentralize this so that you can move really fast or you have to burn insane amount of money to have a lot of people creating stuff and we had that option like we had actually you know in 2020 we had enough investors interested in Mars who wanted who, who you know, pitched in the idea that let's raise in a, a lot of money like you no know, 50 or 150 million dollars to actually have uh, you know one team per micro app and then we have you know like uh, 400 developers building that stuff mm -hmm. and uh, we didn't go for that and we didn't go for that why because uh, you know, it's not like you have to just build those things once and then you have them, you have to keep building them. It's like right. little products, right? Mm -hmm. You need owners of those little products. Mm -hmm. And then I realized that there are a lot of people outside Mars who want to build products and own the products and make money on those products. And uh, and here are the products you can kind of build and own and, and make money on. So when it's, it's actually quite fascinating because I don't know if I've ever came across, come across anything like this. John, you know, especially fully coded. That just is very new to me. I mean, the, the nearest analogy that I have from my no-code world is, I feel like, you know, Webflow 
for a while, I don't know if they still have it, but they had this concept of clonables, right? Where mm. they would they would like highlight, you know, community um, coded uh, Webflow templates that anybody who just joined can go in and then clone, you know, and use it, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I don't know, it, it might have morphed into something now, but that was a brilliant move, you know, by, uh, because they're, not relying on just the core team of Webflow developers to do this on the team, they're relying on the community, you know, yeah. um, to come together and like come up with some really creative um, Webflow websites. I think, I don't know if I've seen anything with the code side of it, right? Like that's well, just brand you new know, to uh, me. When we started that and when I was pitching this to investors and I pitched this to 200 investors, <laughs> like, wow, uh, yeah. Because I was from that world and I wanted to go yeah. the VC way and, yeah, 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 and, yeah. and I kind of went that way and I just kind of, you know, counseled in the middle because I just realized that it will harm the project. I realized that if we have VC funded company, uh, we can't execute on the vision of uh, sharing, uh, you know, the whole project with everyone because now it's not just mm. that others can build stuff, but others can build and kind of co-own the whole platform and, and the system with us, right? And and that's right. different comparing to, you know, uh, other kind of plugins, etc. because your plugin can be just kicked out of the system and you're, you're out of the business, right? But in our case, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we can have different model. But uh, now, you know, this year, so my prediction back in 2018 was that uh, in four or five years, uh, all you know, all ID slash no code slash uh, platforms will realize this. They will realize mm -hmm. two things. First, they have to, uh, you know, uh, involve the community to build the yeah. stuff, right? Right. That's one thing, right? And we see that, like, you know, the uh, Replit has bounties and then the yeah. Superbase now is paying people for creating plugins for Superbase and Vercel is, is just putting high PR to everyone who built stuff for Versal. Uh, so it's like, it's really big now and, and we'll just grow. Uh, mm -hmm. So we will see a lot of, you know, the, the, the pro code environments start doing that. And that's happening already, right? But right. we've been doing that from the beginning. So we're kind of far ahead of the game, mm -hmm. uh, but it's not difficult to explain this stuff to people today. Mm -hmm. It yeah. was extremely difficult. You know, it, it sounds obvious now, but in, right. in, in four years ago, when I talked to people, they said like, uh, why nobody is doing that? And you know, uh, if it was good, people would be doing that, right. <laughs> etc. <cetera. laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. This is a good segue for us to talk about um, Unicorn Platform, right? And uh, I brought on Alex um, on the podcast, you know, which is something that you said you watched. So he gave yeah. his version of how Mars acquired, I mean, you acquired uh, Unicorn Platform. It was a great episode. We had so much fun. And he, in the middle of the episode, like four or five times kept saying, Kippy, you have to bring John on for this. You have to <laughs> talk to John about AI, you know, all that. So here's, here's us now giving a shout out to Alex. Um, so tell us the story of the Unicorn Platform acquisition, you know, from your lens, John. Yeah. So since our vision is to grow you know, by the community, with the community, with the other founders. So when I say community, I basically mean other founders. So for Mars to succeed, we have to gather like 300 founders under one umbrella where every founder is actually independent and, uh, you know, gets all the good part of being a founder and we kind of take away all the uh, bad parts of being a founder. It's kind of like like the dream place to be. <laughs> and uh, and then we had, you know, we had a lot of microbes to be built. Some were built, some were not built yet. And then I had the profiles of the people I needed. Like I had profiles of the people with the type of the product they're building. And one of the profile was a no-code landing page builder. So I just went on the internet and I just tried uh, all no code landing page builders. And I really loved Unicorn. It was uh, like, you know, it was not as advanced uh, as the others or, or you know, um, like it was not having so many features and it was quite strange. It was like, you know, just one guy and uh, it, it didn't look like, <laughs> like, like a real company. But, you know, from other hand, I kind of felt like there's somebody who really, really puts thoughts into every little click and a feature and a text on this 
you know, product. And, it, you know, uh, those kind of people are really, really good at, uh, you know, building products. And I, and, and, I, and I thought, like, one thing that I want to acquire the no-code tool that already has users so that we could just, you know, swap that with our micro-app and basically our micro-app uh, would just get, you know, faster to the market because right. the alternative is to just, you know, uh, promote them one by one. But then I thought, like, if we you know, build one and then we buy one and then we can merge all of those things together, then we suddenly, you know, far ahead. And then the other right. thing is that uh, I don't just need the project, I, I also need the founders to join our, you know, we call it Marsverse. And then um, <laughs> I followed Alex for name. one year. So I follow him for even a year and a half. He didn't even know that. Mm. So I, right. I, I, I read every t tweet he write. I, I read... <laughs> Uh, everything basically. I was like a spy on him, <laughs> right? I don't think there was anyone in the world who was watching him more than me <laughs> in that year. Uh, it was not only him, it was like 10 people. I kind of right. shortlisted. Uh, and he was, uh, like, in my opinion, so much better exactly at that landing page stuff. Mm -hmm. And also, I saw that he was so good at uh, some of the things I'm not good at. Mm -hmm. And then I I felt like this really good fit where I need uh, the project that that's kind of popular uh, mm -hmm. so that we can merge it with our micro because we have the same micro within Mars. And then uh, I want that stuff to be run by someone, not, not employee, but someone who actually cares. Right. And then I needed somebody for Mars who could help me with certain things. And I saw that Alex is the guy who can help me with those things. So it was like, Perfect. Like there, there was no one in the world better than Alex for for that kind of uh, avatar I I built in my head. And then I started talking to him. So, and it was quite quick. So I had one. Wait, chat did you with him. in your first chat or in your first conversation? Did you bring up the concept of acquisition, or was it just to kind of get a feeler of the founder? Oh, uh, you know, it it was funny. Like it felt like we all we both knew we what okay. we're going to talk about. I don't know why, uh, and. Uh, in one chat, we just talk about everything. So we just started mm -hmm. talking, uh, and by the end of the conversation, we agreed about the deal. And that was like, <laughs> wow. really fast. I think it's like no. So uh, I'm actually the other thing the I'm fastest, curious. Is, did he, yeah. I'm curious. Did, did he put any feelers out there about wanting to exit? Or no, wanting to be no, quiet? no, never. So there was no even a little sign of him wanting to sell it, right? And. Uh, like so your pitch me, was really persuasive then on that call. You must uh, have really convinced him. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think it's uh, it's next after that. Uh, do you want to sell sugared water or yeah. we change the world? <laughs> I think it's the next one after that. <laughs> right. It's Steve Jobs. Yeah, I remember that. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Because, you know, it's it's very hard to get get a founder who's committed and who's so like him. He's so obsessed and committed and driven about the platform to, you know, to say, all right, just sell this to me now. Um, I am sure. Yeah, you, but he wouldn't sell price. it uh, on a traditional acquisition. Yeah. Like he wouldn't sell right. it for cash, uh, and yeah, that's yeah, it, yeah. right? Yeah. So and and you know, uh, I watched him for such a long time that I had very good feeling on uh, what he really wants. I saw yeah. him struggling with stuff he didn't want to struggle with, right. and I felt like he would really benefit from from us taking that struggle away and giving him more space in the stuff he really loves doing, it, yeah. like, like product and marketing. Yeah. So, you know, one thing that came to mind when you were talking about sort of bringing some of the best founders into Marsverse and letting them be themselves, it's yeah. a very refreshing idea, John, because I, I, I think, um, I feel like it has a lot of potential even beyond, you know, um, the scale it is right now. You know, I'm trying to think about it for the next 20 years, 25 years. Yeah. You know, it reminds me of like what, you know, what Disney has done, you know, for, you know, if you say like Marvel series is like, it's independent on its own, right? Like Marvel's got yeah. its own set of movies, but it's still Disney, right? And like, there's so many like that, right? Um, and the creative freedom for the director or for the, for the people who are working on that is so theirs. It's not, you know, it's not so um, influenced by the acquirer. Right or or yeah. whoever's like you know, above them. So I think that's a very refreshing thing, especially in tech, because I don't I don't know if they, there's there's any um, other examples that I'm trying to you know 
think I'm, I'm drawing a blank. You know that there's yeah. really good example that you will really like. Uh, think of labels, like the music oh. labels. Yes. Okay. So every single singer in the world mm. has, you know, he is a part or she is a part of the music label. But mm. we don't care about the label. Like we mm. see the person to be, you know, right. self, and they look really independent, right? Mm. And they are independent. But then there is a label who takes care of all the stuff that, you know, no singer wants to take care of, like production right. of the, in all times, production of the CDs, right? And and now like distribution, etc. So I think uh, basically the label logic applied to tech world and mm. not just to the whole tech world, but actually to the indie world right. might be one of the biggest things that's going to happen to the to the indie tech world in the next five, 10 years. Why? Right. Because, uh, you know, in that case, basically the whole indie world becomes like one large label that can just, you know, bait everyone who is like right. all the big, all the big corporations, because otherwise, you know, the every single indie hacker is facing, you know, large corporation or VC funded startup. And that's not fair uh, battle, right? Right. And, and here, like, you know, there is an army and uh, I think this is like, I'm sure there will be a lot more than we doing this. Like it, it'll be a really big thing soon. I'm, I'm pretty sure. And I'm seeing this happening now in Twitter, uh, unofficially, I see this little labels kind of like coalitions, uh, popping up among you no know, two, three, five, ten 10 builders and makers. Right. And it makes sense to collaborate, right? Because then you have shared resources and shared distribution. Exactly. Right? I've been saying this even like in, a, in the earlier sort of episodes of this podcast, I was just saying, I feel like one of the things that you, you will see is, um, you, we may see is creators who have an abundance of distribution collaborating with an indie hacker who loves product and loves sort of the creative side of it, but may not care about the distribution as much. That is a deadly combo because then you have someone exactly. like Alex who loves the details, the, you know, the, the micro copy and like, you know, all the fine craftsmanship. And you have someone like me on the other side, you know, someone, not just me, but like someone like me yeah. who loves the distribution, like the, the, you know, flywheels and putting it out there in the world. So I think we'll see a lot more collabs like that happening. Um, it'll hit the indie world. I don't think it fully hit the indie hacker world yet, uh, but I think it'll hit soon. I, I think indie world is a bit concerned about this. And yeah. their main concern is that, uh, you know, there's a pie and we, we're having, you know, each our slice. Mm -hmm. But what indie world has to understand is that uh, we can, it's not zero sum game. So we can yeah. actually all win because we're going to take the pie of the corporations. And then the and we can expand the startups. pie too, right? We can yeah, expand the exactly. pie. Pie is not a fixed thing, right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, I love it. So, so tell me about um, the other acquisition that you were part of like a few years ago you we were talking about there was an interesting story there tell us the tell us the full story yeah so i have uh, two stories one quick and one uh, not that quick so i will start with a quick one so we my first acquisition was in 2014 it was an icon project so i just uh, wanted to buy a project so i i made some money on uh, on startups and then uh, I didn't know what to do with the money and I didn't want to buy a house or actually I bought a house and then I had some left and I thought like, I want to buy a tech company. And back then the prices were really low, you know, like <laughs> for a million dollar, you could buy like really good business back then. Now you can buy like, you know, barely profit, barely profitable startup. Right. Uh, so, and we bought this. Uh, so we, we looked at all these uh, marketplaces uh, where they sell stuff. And we found one startup that had a million monthly uh, visitors. It was the Icon project. It was called Icon Search. It was like the right. biggest Icon Search project back then. Wow. And we thought like, uh, since it has good traffic and people who look for icons are either developers or designers. So it's a good asset. Uh, we can you know build other stuff on that. Odin's later. So we bought that. Uh, and then, uh, you know, our plans changed. So uh, we spent six months uh, doing improvements there. And then we realized that we don't want to really work with this stuff anymore, because, uh, you know, it was a lot more interesting stuff happening. And it was just mm. icons. Uh, mm. It was quite boring. So we sold it after six months. So we bought it for I don't really remember 
the price, but we sold it for a double of that price, which was good. Nice. Um, it was good. Yeah, that was like the short story. So I kind of tasted this world and I liked it. So I realized that uh, at any given time, there are quite a lot of good startups uh, that you can buy below uh, the market price because people just might say yes to an offer. Like, you know, even those who don't think they want to say yes, you know, when they get the offer, they may say yes. Right. Uh, and, and then the, the other project was, uh, uh, I was building uh, this uh, platform to list your apartment uh, mm. for sale. So in Oslo, it's really expensive. Like you have to pay uh, a lot of money to sell your apartment. And then we wanted to make this system where you just kind of enter your address. It just finds the apartment and then uh, you can uh, just complete the whole uh, process, sign the documents, etc. Right. So it, and uh, we started that project in uh, November. So uh, it took us three months to build it. So it was released mm -hmm. in 1st of February, I think. And 15 days after, uh, two potential buyers came in. Wow. Nobody expected that. We didn't yeah. have users. <laughs> uh, but wow. we were just very, very lucky. So basically what happened, uh, that year it was... 2016 or 17 uh, at that year uh, there was big hype among insurance companies that they have to have uh, some product some digital product because they were kind of offline companies they were selling insurance kind of boring stuff and then right. uh, I think there was an article from Deloitte or, or McKinsey some big consultancy firms and then all of these large insurance companies and, and banks read that and then they realized they have to build some product. And then they had just few options. Like one was uh, in the home buyer space, one was in the health space, and one was in, in just consumer space. And because home buyer has mortgage, right? Yeah. Uh, so basically they realized that if they own the platform where people buy and sell housing, they can sell their mortgage there just it's by actually, default. It's actually quite clever, right? It's a quite clever move. Yeah, and uh, no, nobody thought of it uh, until that year. And that year, like, you know, somebody mentioned that and then everyone from the banks and insurance companies like, that's a brilliant idea. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, for them, you know, go and build this stuff. They have never built any digital product, right? Uh, so some went and assembled the team and started building stuff and some just started looking for acquisitions. And there were a few in the market uh, who were doing this. Uh, so... Uh, when they came in and uh, they made an offer and then the other company made a contra offer and then this made a contra offer and then the whole thing was sold and it was not a lot of money i think it was uh, back then like over five million dollars so it's uh well, that's a lot uh, even back then right yeah uh well it's not like a billion dollar exit right yeah. so it is uh just five million but for the time it took to build a project yeah. and also for the potential like uh, you know, fast forward, it didn't work. Like, uh, yeah. none of those projects worked out. Why? Because when people sell the house, it's such a expensive and important thing mm -hmm. that they trust a person, right? They don't want to save, you know, money when the apartment price is like a half million dollar and saving $1,000 is like, doesn't make sense, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and we had that feeling, uh, that's why kind of, uh, everyone agreed to, to sell because, uh, you know, sometimes you do stuff you don't believe in hundred percent basically. Yeah. And, uh, but that was and a remarkable once... stroke, stroke of luck though. Like you said, yeah, exactly. Right? It, it was yeah. lucky. And you, you just sometimes have to build stuff, uh, and you know, you might be just lucky and sell it. So it's not always, right. you know, things make sense. Yeah. Um, I also want to, um, uh, I also want to note here that this is still a million dollar exits podcast, John. You're raising the ceiling. To oh, it's, it's a million. All right. So all right. I, I want to do it's a new a series billion. called a Billion Dollar Exits, and I'll bring you in for that one. Just kidding. <laughs> um, so tell us, tell us a little bit about sort of where, where, what are your thoughts on sort of the current acquisition market? You know, because um, you're looking at a lot of marketplaces like Acquire.com, which is micro acquire, right? I brought. Um, Brought the founder uh, Gazdecki, Andrew Gazdecki, on the on the show. Um, there's, you know, he, he was talking about sort of the rise now. There's a rise of activity 
right, from both buyers and sellers about acquisitions. Yeah. Um, I'm not so deep into Flippa and other things, but I feel like from what I'm looking at Twitter, um, between Microns, there's another one, which I yeah. think you're looking at. So Microns, Acquire, and a few others. I feel like this is the time to build something to sell, right? Which is a great period, I feel like. It's blowing up. You know, What are your thoughts on, on where we are? Yeah, right I, I think the acquisition market will uh, you know, grow a lot more than a lot of people expect. Uh, yeah. And the main reason is this. So in all times, uh, there were very few people building startups. So the mm. distribution was easy, actually. Mm. Like mm. The, the stuff I built before 2015, we never really had a struggle of distribution. Like no, now uh, all the jokes are about like people won't come to use your product, go and market. Like we didn't have that problem back then. Like actually people would come and use your product. Like we launched <laughs> this first uh, movie app in, in, in the app store and it was like the first of its kind just because, you know, it, now you have everything in the world, but back then like some things were missing. So, right. and we, we just got users, you know, we launch it and in the months we have 70,000 users. Like now nobody yeah. gonna find your app, right? Yeah. So, so because of that now, uh, it's really hard to find people who are good at both distribution and building. Right. That's why people who are good at building, like we partly solve that problem, right? Like by mm -hmm. by putting them together, etc. But in the outside world, people who are good at building, they tend to, you know, uh, not fall in love with distribution. So they kind of yeah. try, they get some little MRR, etc. And then they feel like oh, I want to get back to building, uh, mm. but but it's not the right way to do, right? You have to actually market it, and then for them, selling it to someone who is the opposite. It's great for everyone, right? Somebody right. buys that stuff and then, you know, falls in love with marketing sales. It's great. This guy goes back and builds new stuff. Like you, right. you see now people who sell something on the acquire.com, et cetera, they sell a lot of stuff. Like I barely yeah. see a person selling just one project, like, you know, fourth, fifth, seven, eight. Like, it's kind of like, lot. it's kind of addicting in a way. Just once you get the high of, oh, I, I see the journey. Now I'm like, going, I want to go back and do this again. Yeah, exactly. And on the buyer side, it's also great. Look, like if you want to test, you know, this this uh, builder world, like you want to build some stuff and you are not developer yourself, that's the worst place to be. Like now mm. we are having this no code stuff and you can learn, but not everyone, you know, wants to do that. And if right. you don't learn some way to build stuff and you just outsource it or hire mm -hmm. people, that's like uh, the best way to fail, right? Like right. I, I almost never seen that work. Like yeah. almost never. I have a personal experience, and <laughs> I, 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 I had a tragic failure story in 2017, where I spent 17 or 18 thousand dollars, John, on an outsourced agency yeah. to build an MVP, which took eight months, which I think exactly. should have been the signal. Uh, but so I wasted eight months, and then almost 20k, um, which now in 2023 I could just go and buy something from you know from uh, Acquire or any of these places, and then just market them, right? Um, Exactly. Think, yeah. So, you know, it's, yeah. it's a good s synergy and uh, the iteration speed goes up. And, uh, you know, if you're, if you're a tiny influencer or, or large influencer and you have, uh, you know, $20,000, you can actually buy a couple of projects and test them, whether yeah. your audience, you know, buys it. And then if, if they buy, then you put more money into improving that stuff. Right. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I feel like over time, as, as sort of, with an abundance of projects um, over time, what I think will tend to happen is, it's kind of like how before the internet, like in real life, right? In the, in the sort of, in real businesses, um, what do you call them? Um, brick and mortar businesses. Yeah. A lot of that activity is about buying and selling, right? Like nobody ever goes and starts a brand new um, brick and mortar store from scratch. They usually like, usually like in, there's, it's very common for someone to just buy a gas station, right? They, know, they don't go and like install the gas station themselves. I mean, rarely they do, but generally they just go and buy a gas station, you know, or 7-Eleven or some convenience store or something, and then you renovate from there or do something else. So, but it, like that kind of activity is very common, buying, selling, buying, selling, flipping or whatever, right? Um, same thing with houses, right? Yeah. People like buy and sell all the time, right? Multifamily homes. Secondary market apartments. is uh, often, you know, greater than uh, building stuff, stuff from scratch. Right. So, which which I think has never really hit the tech world um, because it was only limited to like, you know, very, very high end acquisitions, like, you know, 20, 30, 40 million dollar acquisitions. Yeah. I feel like now as it's coming down to 
affordable acquisitions, you know, I think we're going to see a lot more people try it. But you know uh, why it never happened before? Like, uh, I mm. think the main reason why these small acquisitions never happened before is that uh, we didn't have non-developers yeah. in this world. And developers don't really buy other code because they kind of, you know, they have opinions about code. Yeah, right? they feel like I can Nobody do this myself wants... on a weekend, yes, right? They're like, exactly. I can build it <laughs> exactly. Like, if you don't think so, you're not a developer, News, right? <laughs> the number of people on Hacker News website who think that they could build the next Dropbox you know, on a weekend yeah, is yeah. the proof that they don't hey, think over distribution. Yeah. Exactly. And now we have people less technical. And mm. for them, like, they just don't like the coding stuff. They yeah. just want to get, you know, work done. And then yeah. if zero <laughs> work is better than any work, right? Any work, yeah. <laughs> That is so true, though. Developers are the most, one of the most opinionated, you know, sets of people. We, we, I love them. I'm sure you're one of them, right? But yeah. it's just objectively, they're very like, it's kind of like a chefs, you know, like when, when yeah, the chefs don't exactly. like anybody else's cooking, you know, they trash exactly. them. They're like, they're very opinionated. Um, so that's funny, man. Um, so actually, let's go to, let's go to AI. I really um, have to do justice to Alex's request of me getting to ask you the AI questions. It, he 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 put this in my ear that you've been in some fashion working on some you know AI for definitely more than the last four or five years. So I, I kind of want to understand yeah. where did you catch that bug? Where did you get you know started about you know being curious about it? And kind of walk us through the journey you know through your lens and where is it going you know in your view? Yeah. So AI was my you know uh, my first thing to ever do in the tech world basically so uh, really my, when was that yeah it was like 20 uh 2006. wow so the, it was university so my right. my project for the bachelor was ocr so we were yeah i, I was making this uh, neural network to recognize mm -hmm. handwritten text mm -hmm. and i did that because uh, i was so lazy to go to lectures and my friends went and I want to scan what they write there uh, <laughs> because I couldn't read. You know, right. it's like when people write that like, the handwritten text is impossible to read if it's not yours. Right. right. And, and then uh, I really wanted to have the application that can do that. And there was just two in the world back then. It was Abby and Adobe. Like they had this and it cost like fortune. Like back then, everything was really expensive, like the right. application stuff. Um, and you had to buy a license and it was like huge app, etc. And I thought like, you know, I can try to make one for myself and, you know, everybody would love it uh, because everybody would benefit from it. Um, and I started building. Uh, and, you know, I, I was the type of developer who thought that <laughs> he could build, build that in, in, in a weekend. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, that's so on point. Yeah. Yeah. But actually, uh, you know, I built it quite fast uh, because, you know, like at a certain age, at a certain, you know, time, like you're extremely productive. Like back then I was like crazy productive and I, I just sat on my chair like for 40 hours straight from Friday to Monday morning, I remember. And I had first version. It was like, you know, three layers of the neural network and it was uh, doing fine. It had like 80% accuracy, which is fine, but it's bad. Like you right. you can't really read the text still if it's 80% right. because right. Uh, it misses the important words, not the not important. But then um, I realized that I have to have a project for my bachelor eventually. So I just take this and I just, you know, uh, keep going with it. And I did that. So I just keep, kept going with that since... 2005 actually until 2009 when I finished uh, university. So for four years I've been building this. So and I had to learn everything about AI because it was um, uh, you know I ended up actually uh, building an algorithm where I had a couple of neural networks doing independent work. I had other algorithms and I would exercise all of them and then i would get this uh you know uh guesses from all of them about this word for example and then if two of them agree i would say then that's the word right and that was quite right. a cool approach actually mm -hmm. uh so i came uh, almost to like 98 percent accuracy where wow. fine reader uh and adobe were 99 no 98 four so it was like one percent difference Right. When I presented that uh, at my, you know, at the, at the day where you present your stuff uh, to the committee, pe people didn't believe. 
They thought I'd made <laughs> up the number. Uh, so I had to actually uh, run the whole thing to show that it actually works. I, I even asked them, write something, write as bad as you can. Mm. So it was really good stuff that worked. But, you know, my uh, I kind of regret that I was too young because I had no idea, like, like believe me or not, I had no idea that I could actually build a business out of it. I was really. going to say that you could have turned that into a company. Yeah, obviously. I just, I didn't have a slight little idea, like zero at all. Like it never came to my head. I thought right. I'm studying, right? right? This is for study. <laughs> right. <laughs> and that was kind of sad. And, you know, I don't even have the program anymore. After study, I just deleted everything because right. it was finally, I finished this university. Right. right? <laughs> And then um, I did some more stuff with AI. So my next project was uh, called Ames AI. So it's kind of big stuff now. Uh, it's the biggest monitoring software in the world, I think now. Uh, so that was my first big startup. So I was uh, doing all the tech there. And the whole project was about monitoring complicated systems such as uh, banking systems, ATMs, like the systems where you have thousands or 10,000 of different kind of uh, components w which are offline, like mm. which are physical, connected to the digital, right? And uh, in that world, basically, uh, you don't know if somebody uh, if something is broken until somebody calls you and says this shit is broken, right? Right. Uh, because you, you, now you have cameras, etc. But back then right. you were just standing, like a vending machine, for example. You have no idea if it works or not. Right. And, and then what? 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 What we built? Uh, we built a software that was monitoring everything that's happening with that machine. You know the sales. Uh, the time it takes, like all the parameters, everything, mm. all the numbers. So now right. they call it big data. Big data didn't exist back then, that word, but uh, we kind of did that. So we were collecting a lot of data, everything in the raw data. We were applying these regression models and neural networks on, that, on top of that. And we were predicting the behavior of all those, uh, you know, points. And then whenever we see deviation from that prediction, we would say uh, something is wrong there. And then we would correlate that deviation with the previous historical data. And then we would kind of confidently say that this machine is broken because at this time of the day, um, you know, uh, at that hour, uh, it's strange that it's selling so little or or something like that and it was like huge it was really huge right. uh we got clients uh who were like those this uh, vending companies and atm and uh, on all the stuff that has you know the large corporations basically right uh and for them uh it was saving a lot of money because they wouldn't have the machine that that stays for weeks and they don't know it's broken right mm -hmm. because the problem is that some machine can still work let's say you you, you can buy soda but you can't buy the chocolate bar. Mm. And you can't know that, like, well, people buy some stuff there, right? Nobody's gonna like look at every machine and compare like what it sold yesterday and today, right? Mm. But except, our software managed. Except the data. Yeah, except the data will yeah. tell you the truth, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So that was the second project. And then the third project was uh, the movie recommendation system. So that, that, that was- Wait, is, like this, the, is this the film grain? Film grail, yeah. Yeah, oh, film grail, sorry. Yeah, I, yeah. I think I saw the website of that. That was pretty cool. Yeah, is it, it, still, it was. Is it still going? Uh, well, now it's uh, in the B two B space. So basically, mm -hmm. we built software and it's white labeled, and then it's running as that brand. So mm -hmm. it's big. It has fifteen million users using all that kind of you know white label software combined. So it's, it's wow. very big. And wow. uh, but back then we were doing just an app that helps you find a movie to watch. Right, that was kind of our first app that we made. That got seventy thousand views, and we got the best app of the wow. year back then. And it was so good because we have built this uh, AI model that could basically uh, recommend you a movie that's really good, right? And, mm. and it's not that easy. Like now, it's really easy. Now everybody knows how to recommend stuff. Like you go to Netflix, right. and they are quite good at it. But back then, right. Netflix was just a catalog. Right? Yeah, like everything yeah. was just a catalog, and we just scraped all the catalogs. Netflix, iTunes, uh, you know, uh, HBO, everything. And then we just pour all together and then we, you know, get all the data about you, about your friends, about you. Like back then, Facebook could give you everything. So we would yeah. just take 
everything about you from Facebook, and then we would just run the models, and then we say, like, this movie is really good. But then, if you're watching that with your girlfriend, for example, we would just take both of you and make the model for both of you, and then say, like, this movie is good for both of you. Like, you're going to mm -hmm. like them both. And so, yeah, the, those three projects I work, and it was quite heavy use of AI uh, before, like, anyone that was really using yeah, it. Yeah, so w when you look at the, the latest sort of uh, application of AI now with ChatGPT um, and, you know, DALI and all this, what, what do you feel yeah. now? Like, you feel, um, well, where, where in, do you think this is going? Yeah. Yeah, in 2018, uh, we start using, or 2019, we start using GPT-2. It was, yeah, wow. GPT-2. Uh, and that was Mars. under, it was not open for anyone, I think, right? Yeah, it was like the beta we applied uh, since GPT-1, and then we suddenly got in. Uh, and we were using it, and, and we built quite cool stuff on top of that, and we were quite amazed. But it was kind of, uh, you know, uh, it was failing too often to use it for for things people use it now. So it yeah. would give you good outcome uh, once and then wouldn't give uh, again. And then it gives you, like it was not stable, basically. You couldn't really ask it to produce JSON, for example, reliably back then. Right. So you would have to build some stuff to parse what it, you know, outputs. But still, uh, we kind of liked it. And then, uh, you know, when I was starting with the vision of Mars, uh, so we were kind of confident that uh, we have to build a system that lets you reuse microbes. And then like the main concern for you reusing microbes is that what if the microbe doesn't fit my need? Like it's kind of almost, but not exactly. And then right. my idea was that uh, we will actually manage to get microbes to be able to rebuild themselves using AI. So you just say, uh, you know, you have a microbe for e-commerce or for reviews, for example, and you want to change the, that somehow. And you just tell that what you want to the microbe because you don't want to kind of, you know, dig into the code, right? It's not your microbe. So you just ask it using AI and then it just, you know, reassembles itself and it's wow. new. It's, it's just for you. So we had that vision from the beginning. That's why we kind of made a high bet on microbes because we knew that eventually when AI gets very powerful, uh, this combo will be really good. And then uh, the time went on. And then in uh, last year, uh, when GPT-3 came in, uh, we st we connected GPT three with microbes, uh, and it was amazing. So yeah, like the moment I run it, I remember that uh, it was just really good, and I and I had this like blink in my head, like yeah, like uh, AI world has come to where <laughs> I want that world to come, right? But that right. was before the hype, and I yeah. felt like a madman. I remember, like you can ask Alex, I was like telling everyone, like. Like we have to do everything with AI. And I like people just thought I'm crazy because they all use Siri and they thought like, well, well we saw AI, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's not that good. Right. <laughs> yeah, but you know what I did, I built a lot of stuff with AI last year and I used it since then. And I think that was kind of one of the main reasons uh, why everything I do grew up so well since then. Mm -hmm. So basically I built this little project I don't have a name for, so it's kind of the agents where you uh, program an agent with the prompts and AI, and then the agent behaves like you program. Like I, I have lawyer agent, I have accountant, I have developer, I have oh. myself, and etc. Um, wow. Yeah, and I use that since then, and you know it made me like ten or twenty times more productive. Uh, right. And you know we have no people in the company who are not developers now. We have no lawyers, no accountants, like no <laughs> almost no support people. Everything is right. done by AI. Everything. Wow. So we're extremely productive, and we we're doing that for a long time, like since mm. the beginning of the last year. Where do you where do you think is the biggest opportunity in the AI land now for like for for the listeners who are like just thinking about okay, I want to build something in the next six months or the yeah. next I don't know three months. Where, where do you think are some open gaps or open areas that you want to explore? I think it's UX. I think wow. people should try to come up with really clever ideas with UX because I wouldn't say there is any solution yet to the UX on top of AI. Like there are mm. a lot of attempts. Uh, you know, Notion is doing well. Everybody copies Notion, but it is not still like limited use. It, it works well for the documents, but if you look at almost everything else, 
like coding where we are doing that stuff yeah like that's uh uh you know not working that well like most developers don't use it but the way we use it you know mm. it's, it's it's different from everyone else but then there are more simple stuff like for example uh the regular stuff like accounting lawyers or uh, chiefs you know cooking little businesses like you can just right. f go to the, the the bakery business and and see how you can you know apply uh, ai with a good ux there so it's a lot of opp opportunities and i so would if, focus if on I not to... sexy one yeah I, I mean that's no that's that's a smart sort of distinction right but if i were to ask you like from a layman point of view one thing that i feel like i'm struggling right now is when i see the demos i'm blown away but i when i try to use um, oh, when I go into my user, my, my normal routines, I feel like it still hasn't yeah. percolated into my user yeah. habits, you know, but, but I, I'm a, I'm like mainstream sort of layman, you know, not a very early adopter. Right. Mm. I mean, I am early in a way, but like compared to my wife, right. But, yeah. um, compared to maybe you and like Alex who are living in the AI world, I feel like that is the, that is the, dis the challenge I'm having, even with, I'm, I'm a paying customer for chat GPT, but I rarely use it, you mm -hmm. know? It feels like a very powerful toy, but it's not integrating into my workflows, and that's been a that's been a challenge. Yeah, like, and that's UX. Like you have to mm. copy and paste stuff, right? Yeah. You have to wait for stuff. You mm. have to remember where exactly and how exactly you have to write that. So I think there is like enormous amount of uh, you know possibilities to do good UX on top, and I would just not recommend anyone to do anything deep tech there because yeah. that's just too complicated uh and uh, you need resources but ux is easier but when you do ux try to do something that's not that you know uh, obvious or not that popular because if it's so popular most likely uh the bigger brands will just include that as a feature you know like yeah. do not build uh, a product for g for for the email right like, yeah. like gmail will come with that <laughs> gmail right? will come be. yeah super yeah. human is there already like with their yeah. so just just don't enter that but there are like other like the second wave uh, yeah. where like Google will not build anything for the bakeries, mm -hmm. right? Or, mm -hmm. or et cetera. So I would just go there and, and I see people doing that. And if you look at the uh, in the world and the race of uh, Indies, um, this year it's crazy. Like I see people who, who were struggling to get any uh, MRRs for years and they built quite a little good app on top of AI. Uh, some people say it's a wrapper, but who cares? And they right. they're right. making like you know five or ten thousand dollars a month. Yeah, I mean some popular examples like I mean Danny Postma and like um, Level Tayo they've gone into yeah. I think Photo AI is one of them and the other ones like the uh, I forgot what the other one is but I feel like there was a interior design AI tool right. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's a little niche compared to mainstream and it's a pretty good MRR both of them. So I think yeah I think I agree to your point about. You know, look at some of the boring niches or unexpected niches, um, and then build 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 AI tools for them. Yeah, fascinating. Um, all right, so I know we're almost at the end of the hour. Uh, I can feel like I could go for another hour <laughs> with you, John. It's been a blast. Uh, I want to say thank you so much for being on the show and for such a delightful, reflective conversation. You know, I I learned a lot, and you know, I feel like we gave some playbooks for for the listeners too. So thank you. Yeah, thanks for your chat, KP. Invite me again after one year. Maybe I have something new to say. Yes, I would, I would love to have you back again soon, all right? Yeah. All the very best with Mars and all the other projects. Yeah, same to you. Thank you.